CR101radio.com, podcasts, and more. Welcome to Out of the Question, a podcast that looks behind some common questions and uncovers the question behind the question while providing real solutions for biblical world and life view. Your co-hosts are Andrea Schwartz, a teacher and mentor, and Pastor Charles Roberts. Thanks for joining us again for this conversation between me, Andrea Schwartz, and Dr. Charles Roberts on out of the question podcast. If you saw the title, which you no doubt did before you clicked on to listen, uh, it probably sounded a little weird. Should you be an atheist? Okay. Why don't we jump right into that, Charles? What do we mean by should you be an atheist? I suppose the knee-jerk reaction is, well, of course you should not, but Back of that question is the context of the question, because it may surprise some listeners to know there have been times and places where followers of Jesus Christ, believers in Christ as the divine Son of God and the second person of the Trinity, have been classified as atheists. And what we are wanting to do, I think, in this discussion is key off on that idea, especially as the groundwork was laid for it in Dr. Rastuni's essay, The Atheism of the Early Church. That also happens to be a title of one of his, I would say, most accessible books, and one that, of course, we're going to recommend to everybody. That's the title of the lead article or essay in the book, The Atheism of the Early Church. So we uh, need to address the issue of what in the world would have led the earliest followers of Jesus in the Roman Empire, to be classified as atheists. So context has a lot to do with this. If you just identify someone as an atheist today, people would say, oh, they don't believe in God. They would traditionally say the God of Scripture, probably more often than not. But the context of the early church, the first century church and the centuries that followed, had to do with a conflict of religious views of God, who God is. Is God as the Bible describes him, or is he something else that came out of Greco-Roman culture? And I think people have kind of steered away from the idea of context, because on the one hand, if you put too much emphasis on the context of the people living at that time, you could come away with an idea that said, well, I guess it doesn't pertain to us now. That was then, and they were dealing with issues then that aren't issues now. Of course, the problem with undervaluing context, you miss a lot of the nuances, sometimes even the jokes that, you know, St. Paul uses a sarcastic wit to communicate the errors that he's talking about. And so there needs to be a balance of context because just like the early church members were called atheists. They were also called cannibals. Why on earth would you call a Christian from today's view a cannibal when that's so antithetical to what we believe in terms of what the scripture says? So what we're really talking about is the view of God that was present and promoted. So what was their view of theism, Charles? That then when you put the A in front of theism, atheism would qualify the early Christians as being atheists. In that context, on one level, of course, the followers of Jesus, the Christians, uh, denied the reality or the divinity or the sovereignty of the pagan gods of ancient Rome and Greece. Zeus, Apollo, Athena, all the rest of them, and a host of others. They rejected belief in those gods. So on one level, that got them to be referred to as atheists. On the other level, though, and we touched on this in a previous discussion about the issue of the one and the many. Sooner or later, paganism, if it's going to be successful in its own enterprise, evolves itself into tyranny. It must because otherwise it is total chaos and it can't exist. There has to be some centralized organizing authority. 
If it may be Zeus, well, Zeus has to have an earthly spokesman. The Christians, and they're living in the context of the Roman Empire, uh, by the time the church began to flourish in that empire, uh, the, the largest group of religious believers and theists were those who either explicitly or implicitly believed in the divinity of the Roman government, especially in the person of Caesar. So, you know, when we hear that, people, we look back and some people do and say, well, those people must have been very silly and primitive because, of course, we know that uh, a man like a Caesar or a Pharaoh could not be God because we understand what God is. But that shows rather um, a very elementary understanding because when we consider the attributes of God, the attributes of divinity, especially as defined in Scripture, well, those people did consider themselves gods. Uh, God has the authority to tell you right from wrong. God has the authority to define what life is and what it isn't. God has the authority to say when life uh, should be taken and when it should be spared. And of course, those government entities allocated to themselves all those kind of attributes. Uh, we could also extend it to say government, excuse me, God has the right to tax you. You know, the earliest examples of taxation, for example, is God telling the Israelites, this is the amount of money you will be giving to the Levites. And that was the foundation of it. And so that is an attribute of divinity. God says, this is what you will do. And humanistic governments of all stripes from that time forward have been copying that to express their own divinity. So the earliest Christians refused to bow the knee to Caesar as the divine voice of authority. The pagan religions and their priests didn't have a problem with it. The Jews didn't have a problem with it. But the Christians were the ones who said, no, Christ is Lord, not Caesar. All right. So that brings up a good point. Um, again, if you don't understand the culture of um, the world that Jesus entered, it's very likely that you have this two-dimensional view or that you look at it with modern eyes and trying to take modern considerations and putting it back then. So how would you describe the knowledge of the people who were going to hear Christ and then were going to hear the apostles like Peter, James, John, and Paul? How did they view life and the meaning of life in terms of this Greco-Roman paradigm? I don't know that we can say with absolute certainty what was in the back of their minds about such things. On the other hand, we do know that for the average person of the Roman Empire, which had a vast amount of those who were uh, slaves and others might have just been common merchants or laborers or workers, uh, their lives were, insofar as they were not followers of Jesus and maybe only first encountering his message, their lives were basically hopeless. This was one of the things that really stood out in the kingdom message was that of hope. It was a very pessimistic and um, not a life where people could have any expectation that their lives would continue on in some fashion or that their lives had any meaning uh, apart from the drudgery, (coughs) excuse me, of day-to-day life. So upon hearing the message of Christ, the message of the kingdom of God, It would have immediately been something that they found very different than, say, what the priests of their pagan religions. And, you know, uh, I I think it would be helpful, too, to understand that for people of that time, the idea of being pious doesn't doesn't mean quite what maybe, say, Christian evangelicals today would think of that term. You know, piety uh, involved maybe once in a while going to the pagan temple and throwing some incense on a burner and saying, you know, hail Zeus or whatever, or in the case of Caesar, which is what got the Christians in trouble, doing that very thing, offering an annual incense sacrifice and saying Caesar is Lord. That was the aspect of their piety. Everything else was pretty much day-to-day living however you wanted to do it. But the idea was, though, that your life in that society was ordered by what Uh, Caesar and the Roman government said was law and what was virtue. And Dr. Rastuni points out in his essay that another aspect of piety was that you were a good 
member of the order of the state. Now, especially among the Romans, they defined a person as good and moral as someone who obeyed the Roman law. And so in that extent, you know, maybe it was sort of a um, uh, an evil copy of being obedient to God's law. But of course, the difference is one is the true God and the other isn't. The obedience to one form of law leads ultimately to meaningless and death. The obedience to God's law leads to life. So when we talk about Greco-Roman, I think it's important to identify the fact that when Rome conquered Greece, as all conquering nations did, they would appropriate things from their conquering, from the people they conquered. Um, And this would be true in terms of every time the Hebrews were conquered, that they had been given this um, covenantal trust. And so it's not surprising to find in various other cultures elements of biblical truth, because part and parcel of God's plan involved the Hebrews going and living among other cultures like the Egyptians at times when they were um, under the authority of the Assyrians and then the Babylonians and the Greeks, etc. But in the Greco-Roman world, the highest position or the, the institution that had the greatest primacy was the state, which is very different than what the Bible says, that the family is the basic institution and the state of all three, the family, the church and the state is the least important. And so you were viewed as a citizen not as a son or daughter, uh, a friend uh, in terms of a Christian point of view. And we see this played out that when Paul claimed his citizenship as being a Roman, suddenly he was protected. If he had not been, he would have more than likely been dead or trampled or whatever the case may be. So understanding that the individual responsible to God was not part of this culture. In fact, when Jesus came and said, I came to set the captives free, wouldn't you agree, Charles? The captives were the people who understood how much they were under tyrannical rule. Yes, and something else that made, in addition to that, the biblical message, the kingdom message, such a threat to the social order of the pagans is the fact that they were only familiar with social orders based on the theology of the gods of what I'll call space and time. So, you know, we know from the, say, the writings of Josephus that when the Romans attacked Jerusalem and sacked the temple, one of the things that they did is they carried off artifacts from the temple back to Rome to display. And that was something that they frequently did whenever they defeated an opponent, uh, an, another nation, they would carry off emblems of the gods of these people that they had defeated. Because in the pagan mind, the gods were tied to the land where you lived. So uh, we would carry off, we, we Romans will carry off the statue of your god and put it in our temples to show that your gods are now captive to ours. And so if you're, uh, you're, you're, your people are defeated, your land is invaded and taken over, that's the end of your gods. See, but biblical faith is totally different than that, because the true God is not a God of space and time in the sense of the pagan world. And that was something the Romans in particular and others could not quite get a handle on is how in the world can these people be living in our social order, but they claim to believe in a God that's not in any way tied to us. I think Rostuni mentions in one of his writings that there was one of the Roman emperors, I think, um, well beyond the time of, say, Caesar and Caligula, uh, excuse me, Nero and Caligula, who actually had a statue of Jesus put into his personal chapel and claimed to be so pious to to, uh, enthrall his Christian subjects that in addition to the other gods, he's praying to Jesus as well. So this is something that uh, I think people don't fully understand is that the foundation of pagan religion is that their gods are gods of space and time. The foundation of biblical religion is that our God transcends those things and cannot be captured and carried off into somebody else's temple and that his law order stands. So anytime you have a social order, a law order that is based in any other deity, any other concept than the true God of scripture, uh, 
there's going to be inevitable conflict. And one will eventually win, of course, and we know which one that is, the, the God of Scripture. But in the meantime, there's a lot of conflict and a lot of accusation. It's interesting, too, and this is something else that Dr. Restuni mentions in that essay on the atheism of the early church, is that when you read the writings of the earliest church fathers, one of the things, and he mentions one in particular, I forgot which one it was, but they were deeply concerned about the fact that the ones leveling these charges against the Christians as being atheists were not common people, but it was the more enlightened people of the time, the, some of the, the, the politician philosopher types who really ought to have known better, but that was the way they interpreted it. And um, if I may just go one step further, you mentioned at the beginning <clears throat> that Christians were accused of atheism. They were also accused of cannibalism. Right. And one of the reasons for that was, is that the early Christians sought to deliver children who had been left under overpasses and bridges to die. Um, there, there was abortion quite common in the Roman Empire, uh, but so was infanticide. And so the Christians would, and I'm sure many of our listeners have heard those stories, they would um, rescue these children and, and raise them as Christians. So the Romans had to come up with some explanation as to why the Christians were doing this that made them look bad. Because, I mean, the, the smarter among them, the, the more um, intelligent, knew <laughs> they weren't doing anything other than rescuing these children. So they, they came up, they ginned up the claim that the Christians were stealing these babies from under the, uh, the overpasses because they were going to eat them in their ceremonies. And that's right. where the charge of, of cannibalism came from. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, it also was in terms of the church celebrating the Lord's Supper and so Jesus's words, this is my body, this is my blood, that it could have the tag of, see, they're eating flesh and blood. Yes. And so, you know what? Times haven't really changed that much when you want to make other people who are your opponents look bad. You drum up things and maybe there's some element of truth to it, or at least you can associate it. So, yes. You know, we have film, not that they had film at the time, but we had film of them going under the bridges and bringing out children and, and people and bringing it to houses. They're bringing food, right? So the attempt here is to um, discredit someone or a group enough so that people don't even investigate. And I think that really speaks a lot to the threat that the Christians were. After all, they weren't the rich. They were not the philosopher kings, but they were basically undermining the whole structure that women, children, slaves, common people need to listen to we, the philosopher kings. And if you don't, we'll just force you to. I think people need to understand, too, that the, 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 the activity, the action of doing that, that very thing questions the foundation of the social order, which says it's okay if you think you have too many children or you don't, you don't, you don't want any more daughters. You, you, you want sons. So take this female baby and just throw it underneath the bridge. That is something that's a part of the social fabric of a society based on a theological concept that sees the government as the source of all morality. And that government said, yeah, that's okay. Uh, hopefully that sounds familiar to some of our listeners because we've had government that said that sort of thing in a different context is okay today. Um, I was just thinking about this that when I was much younger in the uh, early 1960s, I'll say, there was a time when you could walk down Main Street in the city where I grew up, which was not a small town. It's the capital of the state of South Carolina. And if a person walked down the main street, which was the source of, of business and shopping and all that back in those days, and if they loud enough within the hearing of, say, 15 or 20 people took the Lord's name in vain, that would be enough to stop traffic. I mean, but that was then there were rules against public blasphemy that could get you arrested for taking the Lord's name in vain. That was a, a questioning of the social order of that day, which was based on the Ten Commandments. And by the same token, the social order in the pagan world, both then and now, was 
questioning or publicly blaspheming uh, the moral order that the state and its gods say these things are permissible. And this is all around us today, isn't it? I mean, uh, it would be the same thing of somebody, if they didn't take the Lord's name in vain, walking down Main Street in any city USA, say in 1965 or even more recently than that, and just loudly saying, there is no God. I'm an atheist. That also would be enough to stop traffic. So something like that was going on in the context of these early Christians. They weren't saying there was no God. They were simply saying the God that we worship, the God that we believe in, is God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the true God has revealed himself in Christ, and he alone is Lord and not Caesar. You know, when you're talking about growing up and and having those practices and cultural consensus in place, I think today, what would bring about the same kind of reaction that people as you were growing up had? Now, if you said something in terms of sexual identity, uh, sexual preference, that would be the thing that could get you in trouble. And so that goes back to the idea that culture is aptly described as religion externalized. You'll know a lot about the religion of a people based on their cultural practices. And so isn't it interesting, Charles, that when we look back on Rome and we look back on Greece, there's a lot of emphasis on how smart and how noble and how intellectual they were when the actual practices for the everyday people were not so great. But you see, if you just talk in the abstract and people don't investigate what were the practices of the time, it's very easy to romanticize something which was quite brutal and manifested itself that, you know, think whatever you want until you disagree with us. Oh, and then we'll kill you if you don't change your mind. Yes, and I think, too, it would be helpful to um, throw out the idea of the types of atheism that people can be accused of or uh, allocate to themselves. I remember back when I was in college, I read a book that promoted the atheistic worldview, and the author, uh, it, it was a very popular book in the 1970s, and the author eventually had a debate with the late Dr. Greg Bonson, who pretty well cleaned the floor with him. But this man had a unique argument in that he said that atheism was simply to be without belief in God. The prefix a meaning not or without and theism meaning, you know, God. So he said the atheist is not somebody who advocates a belief that there is no God. He claimed that the atheist is simply a person who has no belief like that. <laughs> That's a little bit of wordplay. Right. Um, but in that, in that book, I also learned, and a few other readings that I did, that people have delineated, we'll say, the virtual atheist and the practical atheist. Uh, the, 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 I'm not sure if I'm using the right word here for virtual, but let, let's say the, the, uh, the self-conscious atheist. That is someone who says, no, there's no God, or I definitely don't believe the God of the Bible ever existed and ever will exist. Um, or I, I definitely don't believe in this God or that God. On the other end are people who would say, yeah, I believe in God, but then they go and live every moment of their lives as, as if there is no God. That's what you call the practical atheist. And the fact is, I'm not so sure that there are examples of either of those. Because, because even though someone may say, I don't believe in the God of the Hindus or the God of the Christians or whatever it may be, that doesn't mean they don't believe in some sense of divinity or some higher authority to which they give their allegiance and their obedience. Now, that may be their own minds that they think is independent of any kind of theological foundation, but it isn't. And so the, then the practical atheist would be you know, someone who says, yeah, I go to church once in a while. I go to church Christmas and Easter. But all of their ideas about just about everything is informed by a completely non-biblical worldview. So if you look at the first commandment to have no other gods before me, God is stating in his word that people are going to have gods, right? It's not like, oh, we'll posit a no God situation, because if you think through the earth, why it's here, how it's here, how it's progressed, 
some authority is going to be granted somewhere. So in the case of the individual who basically says, I'm smart enough to make up my rules myself, it's not like that person is an atheist in that there is no God. They've just transferred the the position of God, the authority of God, the mandates of God to themselves. There is uh, a classic passage, classic in terms of our discussion today, in the book of Acts, chapter 17, where Luke, the author of Acts, records the activity of Paul and Silas as they are preaching the message of the kingdom in Thessalonica. The, the, the Jews roused up the people in opposition to the proclamation of uh, the words of Jesus, and they get them all stirred up. And so the, uh, the mob goes looking for the Christians, and they go to the house of a Christian believer named Jason. And it's interesting. Let me read to you from Acts 17.7 what is said against him for harboring or giving um, sanctuary to the Christians. And this is how he's charged. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. So that right there is a, is a form of an accusation of atheism. They're being accused of denying the voice of authority and the decrees of the true God of that society, which is Caesar, who is in that time and place, the personification of Roman law and the Roman government. And this is a classic example where you have rival social orders and law orders clashing and the ultimate displacement of one for the other. And I think we have arrived at that point in a very graphic way today. There, Let's just take the subject of human life. Who has the authority to grant someone else to take human life? Well, the very same people who claim that abortion, infanticide, euthanasia should be left to individuals oftentimes real, excuse me, rail against the death penalty. So what we have are people determining for themselves right and wrong, which goes right back to Genesis 3, 5. But additionally, we can see that this conflict doesn't resolve by sitting down at a table and you give a little and we'll give a little. As Dennis Peacock likes to say, nobody's bul- nobody's v- neck veins bulged hearing a Christian say, Jesus is my personal savior. That didn't bring about any reaction because they actually liked religion in the Roman Empire because they thought it kept people in line. If yes. your religion says don't steal, that's great. I hope you value that and I don't want you to steal my stuff. It's when, as you pointed out, they said, there is another king. And by the way, Caesar, we'll pray for you. Well, that was the ultimate offense. You're going to pray to another God for me. So where the outrage came, where the persecution came was this conflict of worldviews. And I believe it's accurate to say the church grew because a lot of spectators saw that people were willing to die for something as opposed to going along, going along, going, you know, with whatever the flow was saying, we'll do what you ask us to do because it was really a, a battle between who's in charge. And I hope my listeners have already begun making the connection or will start doing so if they haven't already to, as you just mentioned, things that are happening today. You know, we have just come through a time, and I think it's not over by a long shot, where governmental authority has decreed that Christians will or will not do certain things in their worship services, or they won't worship at all. I just saw a few clips from a documentary that apparently is coming out about what uh, about three or four or so uh, Canadian pastors and their churches had to suffer uh, during the lockdowns. And many, much of this is ongoing. And I know there where you live, it was a, a similar situation. Some places were not as bad as others, but this is a prime example of the law of our modern Caesar saying, you will not do this. And some Christians at least saying, sorry, we listen to the voice of another king and it's not you. And you do what you have to do, but we will not deny this king. And 
and similar in the book of Acts, the passage where Peter and I believe John were being exhorted not to speak in the name of Jesus by the Jewish authorities in that case. And you know, as well as I do what they said, you know, you have to judge for yourselves whether this is right or wrong. But for us, we will not speak. We will not stop speaking in the name of this man. And then when they got beat up, jailed, they rejoiced because, I mean, why would you rejoice being beat up and jailed? Well, because the spirit of God, and again, in the New Testament, when we talk about the spirit, we're talking about the Holy Spirit, that these people had the Holy Spirit, because without the Holy Spirit, nobody would have persisted through all of this. And so when you look at modern day and how Christians are maligned, well, okay, instead of saying we want to preserve human life, we're told there's an assault on women. There's an assault on a woman's right to her body. So we change the words in order to demonize a group of people. But maybe it's just me, Charles. When I see a lot of their efforts, to me, it, it looks almost like they're caricatures of themselves because it's almost like they're trying to convince themselves. And since they feel they're losing, what they have to do is shout louder. And if you shout louder, then somehow you're righter or more correct. We just got to make sure that the other side is not being heard. Yes, and I think it's interesting, too, to consider the charge of atheism in the broader context, you know, in in a more, uh, I'll say, Ten Commandments-based American culture, however, you know, flawed that may have been 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. And let me just stop. Before I say anything else, I want to make it clear that, at least for myself, and I think maybe I speak for you too, when we talk about these things as they were 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, I'm not saying that our goal is to create another 1955 in America. Because some people think that this is what we are after, what we believe. That's certainly not the case. What we are after and what we believe God would have us do is a biblically-based society based on the revelation of his word and his law, because that is the path of life and prosperity and blessing. So in that earlier time where there was at least some effort to give the tip of the hat to that, you know, if a person declared themselves to be an atheist, that in the minds of the common person would mean, well, that person's capable of doing anything. You know, they might kill somebody. They, they might commit adultery. They might do this, that, or the other, because the idea was, To separate yourself from the true God meant that you were separating yourself from the moral order of what that God has decreed is the right way to live. And circling back to the original question about should we be called atheists today, well, figure it out. If the law order of our time or any time is coming forth from a foundation other than God's law in Scripture and the standards of God's justice, then to deny that is, from their standpoint, being atheistic. And these people might do anything. They might rescue babies and, and bring them up to believe in their King Jesus. You know, they, they might say that there are only two sexes, male and female. And it's interesting how these, these quote, blasphemies, you know, have come to replace the, the real and the true definition of those things. As we are recording this, there is a movie that has been released called Life Mark, which I don't know if you got a chance to see, but I did this past week. And it's basically chronicling the result of an unwanted pregnancy resulting in an adoption. And then when the adopted child reached the age of adulthood, being given the option to be in touch with his biological parents. And It's interesting because when I went, I was one of six people in the theater. And you have to wonder, was it just a question of budget that they couldn't advertise it enough? Or maybe I just went on a night that a lot of people don't go to the the movies. But this is a message that is so suppressed. And when you start talking to people about adoption, um, Christians, they'll make the observation, oh, yes. It cost almost nothing to get an abortion, but it could cost upward to $20,000, maybe more, to either adopt domestically or internationally. That very fact is evidence of the religion of 
the West when it's easier to kill than it is to save. And so I, I do believe that this message is one that will be, they'll endeavor to suppress just the same way that you now have people arguing over whether or not states can make decisions as to whether or not it's lawful to kill a baby or not. We, we need to go back to this realization. We are in a war and it's a war between two seeds. And if you haven't figured that out yet, I suggest that you think about it because it's really important for you to figure out what side you're on because the, the Bible doesn't talk about the war between many seeds. It talks about the war between just two. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Dr. Rasuni raises the question about the rescuing of babies back in those times and like a decision today to have a child rather than abort it. And he raised the question about the fact that, you know, these Christians were rescuing these children and the church leaders who were involved in this, I don't know if they were deacons or elders or whatever, whatever, there was an organized team of men, I guess, who would engage in this activity. And uh, what they would do, as we mentioned earlier, they would rescue these babies and then the, the children would be given to Christian parents to raise. There was another thing that made this a problem for the Roman government in that since these children had been abandoned, they were basically non-existent according to Rome. So Rome had no account of them, and of course that meant they couldn't tax them uh, eventually. But <laughs> Dr. Rushton, he raises this question. He says, and I'm quoting him here, how many members of congregations today would welcome an officer of the church coming by with an abandoned baby or two and feel it was their duty to rear them in faith? That, that's a pretty important question nowadays, isn't it? Exactly. And it's it's worth noting that the first question might come up with, well, is it legal? How, how would we get around insurance? How would we be able to take a, a deduction for this child? So we, we've kind of, you know, melded it into how do we get through the state regulations as opposed to, because I imagine there were regulations back then that would have forbidden them from doing it if anybody ever thought anybody would. And just to make it really clear um, in the essay that you reference, Dr. Rajuni points out that abortion has existed throughout you know, millennia, you might say, and before um, even the the Old Testament times in various cultures, but it wasn't as efficient as it might be today. And so this baby that was discarded might have been as a result of an abortion that botched and didn't quite, you know, accomplish the goal. And as a result, a limb or two might be missing or and I might, or the baby was blind because of whatever. So it wasn't that they chose the best specimens. It was like, oh, the child is alive. You're next. So as a family, you would be receiving a blind, a deaf, a mutilated child, one who had been like rescued from animals chewing on its flesh. So we don't want to get the idea that it was just so glorious that everybody was, would have been happy to um, have a deformed child or a child who had a lot of health issues, they recognized the value of life and that they were positioned to do, to, to help this child. And so they weren't saying, well, you know, we won't be able to go on vacation if we do this. They recognized their responsibility to people, to human babies. And had they been in a position to prevent abortion, which we are today, it's a very much of a Christian activity to do what you can to preserve those who are about to be slaughtered. It was in that time and also in our time an embodiment of the sentiment expressed in the book of Proverbs chapter 8. As Dr. Rushdooney frequently referred to that chapter and those verses where speaking of the wisdom of God, there is the reference to all them that hate God's wisdom are in love with death. And Roman culture was very much a culture based on death, especially in the latter stages. And that uh, abandoning of children to death, uh, abortion, uh, was a prime example of that sort of thing. And so it's no coincidence that as what used to be a predominantly Christian culture in our time and in, our, in the places where we live has trended more towards a pagan understanding of things, we see the rise of things like abortion a fascination with evil, uh, 
death, uh, grisly torture, and all these sort of things that have become really, strangely enough, and maybe not so strangely, entertainment today. This is what people entertain themselves with, bloodletting and gore and that sort of thing. And so um, if we can learn anything from our earliest brothers and sisters in Christ, it would be a privilege to be considered an atheist from the standpoint of a state that denies the truth of God's law word, but it would be a designation of us proclaiming a different king and a different law order, and that being, of course, King Jesus and his divine word in Holy Scripture. So true. One thing I'd like to add about our sophisticated techniques today that allow for um, a quote-unquote cleaner um, killing of children. So some people might say, well, we don't see babies under bridges. You know, what are you talking about? Well, we've got technology now that will allow expectant parents to get a view inside the womb and tell them, you're going to have a deformed child. You're going to have it. You possibly could have a child that won't live very long. And so instead of waiting to see what you get in your child, a lot of people are encouraged and in some cases um, told that, well, you know, your insurance might not cover this if you decide to go along with this, that what it boils down to is we're going to remove the children before they show up because what parent wants a deformed, sick child? So we shouldn't have this idea that they were so barbaric then back during the Roman times. We're more barbaric in as much as at that point, they didn't have 2000 years of Christianity and learning the Bible, the Bible being the most well-read book. So in order to be comfortable with our modern barbarity, what we have to do is sanitize us and sanitize the past and then reduce everything to what we read on a Wikipedia page or what we saw in a movie. So this um, understanding of are we atheists by God's definition or are we atheists by the state's definition, it's really important to um, go beyond sound bites and headlines to really determine what God is calling the church to do at this time, 2022 and beyond. And with that, I completely agree. And I'll end by exhorting and encouraging our listeners to get a hold of the little book called The Atheism of the Early Church by Dr. Rastuni. It's a little less than 100 pages in length. You can also listen to the audio lectures that he gave along the same lines. And uh, if you want to pursue these things in more depth, uh, this would be a good way to do it. Listeners, thanks for joining us. As always, you can reach us via email at out of the question podcast at gmail.com. I appreciate all your comments, your thumbs up and your questions that come out of our previous conversations. Thanks, Charles. Thank you, Andrea. Until next time. Thanks for listening to Out of the Question. For more information on this and other topics, please visit calcedon.edu.